All right, everyone. Um, welcome and thanks for joining us today. It's the top of the hour, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, today I'm joined with Teresa Mayfield Mayer from the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science, and she'll present today's webinar on the new collections onboarding process in Arctos. Teresa is our resident pro on integrating new collections into Arctos from fielding questions and troubleshooting to walking new collections through data cleaning and migration. And she's been really key to developing and formalizing processes uh, and procedures for ushering new collections into um, Arctos and getting them successfully up and running. So excited to have her today. Um, and before I begin, let me just um, go over a few resources for those of you who are new to Arctos or are considering Arctos as a collection management system. Um, first on the list is a link to the Arctos data portal at arctos.database.museum, which houses over 4 million records from dozens of member institutions. Next is a link to our website at arctosdb.org, where you can learn more about Arctos, how to join, um, <clears throat> and check out announcements in our quarterly newsletter. And the Arctos Digital Handbook, which includes database documentation and community source step-by-step -step tutorials. And finally, an archive of our previous webinar recordings where you'll also find quick tutorial videos um, and how to perform on how to perform common tasks in Arctos. So please check those out. Um, and finally, I just want to announce next month's webinar topic on managing ornithology collections in Arctos. It's the fifth webinar in our discipline-based introductory series, and it will be presented by MVZ's Carla Cicero on Tuesday, November 10th. So um, please just keep an eye out for the announcement, and we hope to see you there. And with that, I'll turn things over to Teresa. Hello, everybody. Wow, it's, there's a lot of y'all here today. I'm surprised, and pleasantly so. Um, I think the first thing I'm going to do is share my screen with you. So uh, we can check to make sure that you guys can read it. How's that look, Emily? Is it big, small? Yeah, it looks good. Maybe increased resolution by one or so. Okay. A little bit bigger. How's that? Yeah, that's great. Cool. Um, get this out of the way here. Um, okay, so the process that we're going to talk through today is essentially data migration. So it's what happens after um, a new collection has signed an MOU with Arctos and is ready to get started. Um, usually what happens during the process of an MOU is you get assigned a mentor and the mentor is the person who's going to help you through this process of migrating data into Arctos. And what we have set up right now is a project in GitHub to help you work through that. So usually the first step in the process is introducing a new collection to GitHub and how we use it in Arctos. Um, I have a project open here, one of the more recent ones that started for an in collection. Um, it's the minerals at the University of New Mexico. And um, for each project, there are several steps. Right now, I think there's 12. Um, this can always change because things get changed in Arctos and we have new ways of doing things. Um, so the processes might change a little. And the way we manage that is when a mentor gets ready to set up a new project here, um, they, have a list of issues that they can add to the project. And um, they're all numbered. You can see these all have numbers on them um, to sort of help even the mentors work through what are the steps that a new collection needs to do so that we don't forget something and then have to backtrack and redo things. Um, the process isn't completely perfect and different collections have um, quirks that sometimes make the step, you take the steps out of order, um, but in general, this is the way we proceed. So you can see here, the first step here is GitHub for Arctos. So getting an account um, set up in GitHub, getting added to the Arctos team, and then reading the documentation on how we use GitHub. So I'll show you what 
this looks like. Um, the first issue will say GitHub for Arctos and all of these texts that are in blue are links mostly to Arctos documentation that we're asking new collections to read to help familiarize themselves with the ways Arctos works. So what I usually do as a mentor is this issue and assign it to whoever is uh, going to be migrating the data or managing collection in Arctos. Once they've done that, they'll tell me what they've done. Um, and when they're done, we'll close the issue. And that way I know that step is complete. So when you go back, back to look at the project, you can see that these are steps that are completed. These are things that are being worked on. These are steps left to do. So um, I know one of the questions we get asked most often about Arctos is, is it complicated? And how hard is it to get data in and out? Um, so, Unfortunately, yes, it is complicated. And that's because the data that we all are using, sharing, creating is complicated. Um, so often taking someone's Excel spreadsheet or even access database and moving it into Arctos requires a bit of cleaning and manipulation. So most of the steps in this process are related to that um, because in Arctos, we're using a lot of controlled vocabularies. And so the data that um, incoming collections have in their whatever form they have it in has to be matched up or mapped to the way it's managed in Arctos. So one of the things that everybody has to be aware of is that data is shared in Arctos in some situations. So localities, taxonomy, people names, also known as agents, part names, other IDs. Um, this information is shared amongst all the collections. So the second step in the process is understanding what is shared and what is not. Um, Occasionally, if you're doing something in Arctos, you have the potential to change someone else's data. Um, this only happens if you have access to taxonomy or code tables or geography um, and localities. But um, I try to do this first off because I want people to always be thinking that I should think about what I do and make sure that I'm not affecting someone else's data before I do it. So that's the second step. Um, then, now we finally get into, oh, I'm gonna do some work in Arctos. So um, it's managing a collection. And before you can manage a collection, you have to be an Arctos operator. So if you haven't already set up an account in Arctos, we ask you to do that. And then you get invited to become an operator. And at that point, you are given access to your collections, which should have been set up um, right after your MOU was complete. Once you have access to the collection, then it's your turn to manage it. And when you manage a collection, you're adding a lot of metadata about the collection. Um, a lot of this is gonna be important later on when you're ready to publish data to aggregators because the things that get entered into the Manage Collection page are used to create uh, an EML file that's used by the aggregators um, to pick up your data from the IPT. Um, maybe that sounds like a whole lot of acronyms and crazy stuff, but um, you'll, if you haven't already published to an IPT, um, you'll probably get to it in Arctos eventually. And this really is the first step of that. So managing a collection is important. After that, you create your team. So I assume that most people coming into Arctos, um, we're usually dealing with a collection manager, sometimes the graduate student who's been assigned this task. Um, sometimes it's a curator, um, but usually this person who first sets up and manages the collection also has other people helping them, either 
entering data directly or cleaning data or doing other tasks. And so uh, they will have to invite them to be operators and add them to uh, their collection so that they have access to work with that data. So that's what step four is, is adding your people to your collections so that they can help you get work done in Arctos. Next up, we start with actually working on data that's going to be migrated into Arctos. So um, the first step is your people. Um, people come first, that's how Arctos works. So um, we wanna make sure that your people names in your data are already in Arctos as agents. So this includes collectors, preparators, I, people who have made IDs, um, and all of your um, Arctos team. So all those people need to be agents in Arctos. For incoming collections now, oftentimes people find that their agent names are already there because agents are shared amongst all Arctos collections. So um, a lot of the times there's not a whole lot of names to add. For some collections, so for instance, this mineral collection, um, it's only the second mineral collection coming into Arctos. So a lot of the collectors, donors, um, and other people associated with this collection, their names probably aren't in Arctos. So it's going to be um, probably a bulk load of agent names. Uh, but there's a process for doing that to check if those names are already in Arctos or some variant of those names um, because we try our best to not have duplicate people names. Um, every agent can have multiple AKAs. So when we find two agents that are the same person, they can be merged. Um, but we really try hard at the beginning to put a clean set of names for you um, into Arctos so that you can use those names in your data. Once you have all those people names in there the way you need them, um, next up is accessions because you can't enter any catalog records into Arctos uh, without an associated accession. So accessions comes next. Um, we do have some collections who don't use accessions. And in that case, we just set up one blanket accession that everything goes into. Sometimes people are kind of in process sorting out their accessions. And so we'll have some that are complete, they can get entered into Arctos, some that are still being worked on. Sometimes those will go into a blanket and get moved out later. Um, but every catalog record has to have an accession number. So accessions are next on the list. Accessions can be bulk loaded or added manually, whichever is um, preferred by the collection. So that step has instructions for that. After accessions um, comes taxon names. So um, identifications and taxonomy are in a way separate in Arctos. So we have a long list of names that can be used in identification. Um, and it's a controlled vocabulary. And it's used by everybody. One list for all collections. So the, the first step is looking at all your IDs in your file from wherever it came from. And checking to see if those names are included in this long name list in Arctos. And we have a process for doing that. And sometimes what you find, oh, you have some misspellings in your file, you can correct those. Um, sometimes we need to add new names. And sometimes we find that um, your, your data has older names that are no longer in use. And then we make the decision between the collection and everybody in Arctos who's managing taxonomy, do we add this older name and put it, um, its relationship as a synonym with whatever the new name is, um, or how do we handle that situation? So sometimes just the taxon names can take a while because it, it occasionally requires some uh, sleuthing on the part of the collection, especially in the case of misspellings. Sometimes you have to go back to tags or documentation to figure it out. We do have a method for putting um, 
anything you want in identification. So you can always use a taxon name that's already in Arctos and then append it with the spelling that you have. Um, if you want to maintain a misspelling or a different spelling or something like that. So there's ways to do that, but that's the next step in the process because everything is going to have some kind of identification in the catalog record. The next step, taxonomy, doesn't really need to come in this order. It can come way later in the process if you want because classifications are separate from identification. So um, I, I put this as the next step because it, they seem to go together and some people like to do it in this order, but often the taxonomy classification part gets put off till way at the end. So what will happen is if you have records identified as something and there's no classification in Arctos, there just will be no classification associated with those identifications. Um, or we may have classifications that are out of date or different, or uh, maybe you need a whole new taxonomy source in Arctos. Um, so that's kind of a decision that gets made here and then it can get done now or it can get done later because um, what really matters in your catalog records are the identification, the names that are used. Um, the classifications are attached to those names. Next step is higher geography. So higher geography is a um, code table in Arctos. Um, it's a very special kind of code table and we have our higher geography set up so that we don't wind up with duplicate spellings of things um, or two of the same county in, in a state or something like that. There's only one of each. Um, so this often involves concatenating fields in old data so that we get um, continent, country, state, and county. Um, there are some other fields that can go in higher geography, but most collections only use those. Um, and then comparing those to what is exists in Arctos higher geography. Um, for almost every collection, we have to add some higher geography. That's not a really big deal. Um, it has to be done by somebody with access to the higher geography code table, which we have a team of people. I think there's 10, maybe 12 of us now that do that. And so that involves requests in, um, in GitHub so that you can get higher geographies added. But it's pretty easy to do um, as long as it's well documented. We try to use Wikipedia um, as a source to prove that a higher geography exists. Maybe it doesn't seem like the best thing, but it works out pretty well, actually. Once that's done um, and you know that your higher geography in your uh, bulk load file matches what's in Arctos, next are your localities. So specific locality is a free text field in Arctos. But um, if you have localities that are essentially the same place, except they are just spelled out differently, um, five miles from XYZ or five miles north of XYZ, but they're really the same thing. It pays at this point to um, make those things consistent so that you have one locality with all the specimens from that same place instead of multiple localities. Um, if the localities are entered exactly the same, Arctos will eventually merge them. So you'll wind up with just one. Um, if you enter a locality that's exactly the same as something that's already in Arctos, eventually it will get merged with it um, so that across Arctos, anything from this specific spot um, will all show up together. It's kind of a neat feature. Um, this is one where collections can spend as much or little time on it as they want. Um, it just depends on how you feel about it. If you just want to enter your localities exactly as they are and roll from there, it's totally fine. Um, but I always encourage people to at least take a look through it and try to make them more consistent if possible. Next up are parts. Parts are controlled vocabulary in Arctos. Uh, we have a very long list of part names because right now parts and preservation are mashed together in the part name. Um, 
So looking through the objects that you have cataloged and comparing what you have and what is in the Arctos parts name list um, is pretty much a, can be a big undertaking. It depends on what you have. Um, for some collections, it's pretty simple. Maybe you just have study skins and skeletons. Um, but for other collections, um, I recently worked on a paleo collection where I, there's probably, I don't know, a hundred different part names. So um, trying to get those all matched up to the code table can be a little difficult, um, but you can use Excel to do it pretty easily with a lookup and um, get things all organized so that your parts will load into Arctos. Once your part names match up with the code table, um, you should be able to take a bulk load file and load the whole thing. Um, this never really works the first time. It's just the way it is because you'll always discover something that was mistyped or maybe code tables have changed since you started this process two months ago or something. Um, but usually you'll come out with a list of errors that you can go back and correct and then retry with those. Um, so this is the process for taking data from say an Excel spreadsheet or an access database or whatever you had your data in before and getting it into Arctos in one big bulk load file. Um, I will say after just migrating this paleo collection that for me it was a lot easier to do this in stages. So uh, the paleo collections keep their localities very specific. So I was able to upload a bunch of named localities and have them waiting there for me. Um, the next step, I uploaded the identifications essentially. So I uploaded catalog records that had um, a species name and an identifier and a locality, but they had no parts. Um, then I loaded the parts separately to those catalog records because the uh, paleo parts had a whole lot of part attributes, um, which can get pretty complicated. And um, the part attributes, you can't load 10 of them in a big bulk load file. It just doesn't work. So um, the parts had to get loaded separately that way. And actually, I found it worked much better because we could focus on one thing at a time. Um, it made it a lot easier and I think cleaner in the end than trying to load it all at once. But it kind of just depends on the nature of your data, whether loading it all at once or in stages like that makes more sense. So once your data is loaded, um, the next step, which isn't on this mineral collection because they wouldn't do this, is to publish your data to the aggregators. And so we work with VertNet, um, because we um, upload data to their IPT and then it goes to the aggregators from there. Um, so that would be the 13th step in this process. Um, at any given time, you might have a new set of data that you want to add and you can kind of go through the exact same process um, and you can always enter things one at a time manually if that's what you choose to do. So, I think that's pretty much the process. Um, does anybody have questions? Hey, sorry, I was typing here. Um, we do have one in the chat um, from Jessica that I just started to address, but um, she asked, will localities be merged across institutions? I assume you get a warning before they are merged. Yeah, and honestly, they have to be exactly the same to merge. So even if they do merge, so you don't get a warning for merged localities. Um, they will just merge. Um, but they have to be exactly the same in every single field. So even a space or a period or any little different thing, uh, they won't merge. So if you really are intent on keeping your localities 
um, very specific to you, the best thing to do is to name them. So all localities have this field called locality nickname. Um, this is what we did with the paleo collection. We gave each one a very specific name. Um, if you think about uh, paleo collections, they often return to the same site year after year. So then it's very easy to just repick that locality if it has a, a recognizable name. So um, you can keep your locality separate from everyone else by putting names on them. Um, the drawback to that is if somebody goes and geo-references that locality that's exactly the same as yours but doesn't merge because yours has a name, yours won't get geo-referenced. So, um, the advantage of the shared locality model is that other people can make your stuff better. I'd like to make a quick uh, comment on that too to respond to what Teresa said. This is Marielle Campbell. Um, just that when you're migrating data from uh, your spreadsheet or whatever your original data source, one of the really helpful things to do is to uh, sort your localities and go through and find examples where there's an initial space or an extra period or something that makes it slightly different because you may very well want to have all the same localities be the same. Now, this is not true for verbatim locality. You should keep your verbatim locality as it's originally written exactly how it is, including whatever higher geography is written on um, the tag or if it says a country that no longer exists, you, that should all be go into verbatim locality and not be altered. But for specific locality, if you can clean up your localities so that uh, they are all identically shared as they should be, then later if some if you do need to go and georeference them or change a georeference, you can edit all of those simultaneously and you're not having to deal with each one separately because one has an extra space or an extra period. Yeah, and uh, another great resource if, if you haven't worked in um, in OpenRefine, formerly known as Google Refine, it's super great for normalizing um, text. So there's basically this clustering algorithm that will kind of facet your data. Um, and so if you have something that's four miles north of Boulder or four mi north of Boulder, it will actually pull those and ask, are these the same thing? And then you can um, so elect to, to merge those. So it's a great way to really clean your data quickly, especially for um, taxonomy agents and, and locality data. And I, and I believe iDigBio has a, a lot of resources and tutorials for it, so you should check it out. Yeah, it's really, it's a good tool to use. Also, Emily pointed out in the chat that um, another way to lock a locality is to verify it. So um, verification happens at the specimen event level actually, but if you verify an event, um, then it locks the locality and nobody can edit it. So if you know this is exactly the right place with the right coordinates, you can just verify that and then nobody can change it but the per, but people who have access to that collection, who can change it to unverified or whatever if they want. So I think some of you might be here because you're mentoring or want to be mentors. So, um, one thing that I would like to point out is um, when you set up these projects in GitHub, um, it's nice in the project information. Let's see if I can show you. Um, oops. Yes, I want. Here we go. So in the project information, when you set it up, um, as I was thinking about this today, usually I just say which collection it is and um, what we're doing. But it, I think it's a good idea for us to put who the mentors are in the description and who the the lead is in the collection themselves so that we have some, you know, contacts there. If somebody else happens to come along or wants to help or, you know, a lot of times it happens before the migration is complete, especially if there's a student involved um, that the project lead changes. 
um, and we don't know who to contact. So it's good to have as much information in the, in the project description as you can when you set one up. One thing I want to mention is that um, all of the Arctos code tables are um, public. So if you are someone who's considering coming into Arctos and just want to get an idea of um, how would your data even map to Arctos, you can check those out um, yeah, from the yeah. search page. They're a little bit cryptic. Um, I'm hoping that eventually we can get some descriptions here next to the, but these are the code table names. Um, and I think a lot of them can be figured out pretty easily. Um, but, but yeah, you can look at all of our code tables. The only one that, well, there's a couple that kind of aren't here and that is the agents um, because they're their own special thing. Um, so you can search that code table by um, right here by searching agents. Um, and the other one is the higher geography which um, you can search here to look for higher geographies. Um, I guess taxonomy is also the same way. Those, those names um, you search here instead of in that list of code tables. So those three things have their own special code tables that aren't in the list, but everything else, the parts, the other IDs, um, all kinds of attributes and things like that are in the list of code tables. And one thing I also want to say is um, I think, you know, a lot of it might feel like, oh, it's a headache to kind of get my data to, to map and conform, but really um, it's, it's really, uh, our, our system is normalized to make searches really powerful. Um, and for us to have this, this shared benefit of, of pooling our data and for agents, for example, um, each agent has a profile page. And so on it, it will have, you know, all their alias, aliases, all of their, um, you know, potentially their uh, date of birth, date of death, um, any descriptions, any relationships. So um, whether it's marital or academic, um, and then, yeah, all of their, their products. So if you look at Grinnell, um, maybe specimens he's collected or publications he's authored. And so if I'm coming into Arctos and I have a Grinnell um, J and I'm not sure, I can look at this profile and, and, and actually click on his records and say, oh yeah, my agent Grinnell was in, it was in California during this date and it's probably the same guy. Um, so it's, it's a really nice tool. And yeah, this is the, the agent activity page and it really is just a compilation of um, everything that this person has done, whether it's transactions, geo-references, um, projects, which is a, a cool Arctos feature um, we've touched on in other webinars. So it's really powerful. And we don't really put uh, projects and publications in the data migration. It's kind of, that's kind of a, something that comes after. Um, but usually by the time people have migrated their data in, they've kind of experienced some of these things and are excited to start using it. So um, those just kind of happen organically um, after data gets migrated in. Any other yeah. questions? C can I ask a longer question? Sure longer than the chat can handle. Um, so I'm wondering, once you get past the point of, so like in our situation at APSU, we have um, bulk loaded, you know, an initial set of data. As I'm going through and I'm adding new records, I'm wondering about the process of like, does Arctos have a way of, of flagging a locality that I put in and saying, hey, you've entered a locality similar to this before. Could it could it be this one or is it just a matter of adding to my workflow, like checking that list of localities that have been created before and seeing if any on that list are similar? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, it's the second option. Um, okay. Yeah, right now uh, we don't really have the ability to, you know, have you put something in, have Arctos go around and say, oh, we think you meant this at the point of data entry. Um, you kind of have to do that beforehand. 
Okay, so there's some institutional knowledge there. Yeah, <laughs> and you can also, um, I mean, so I don't use the data entry screen, so probably somebody else can chime in here. Um, but when you're entering a locality, you can look for things from the data entry screen. So you could, at that point, go and search localities to see if there was something close and then pick one. Right. It just won't automatically say, oh, there's one that looks like that here. Okay, so so then, so you're saying you do bulk loading mostly. So when you're bulk loading, um, how do you do it in your institution? Like, do you have a list of localities that people commonly visit that you look for to put into your bulk loading file? So yeah, it depends. Um, like I say, for that paleo collection, we did, we had a, li a long list. It's like 12,000 very specific localities. Um, that we could pick by number because they're all numbered. Um, but it, it really just kind of depends on the collection. I've worked in some where it's very scattered and random. People are just going different places. You know, it's a student project this semester in one place and a student project somewhere else. Um, so often it's very scattered. Um, but then I've worked with some where I realized this was a big insect collection that over because it, we're doing it taxonomically um, you start to see the same localities over and over again um, so at that point when i started seeing that i did make a list like here's a, here's a list of these i don't know maybe i had a hundred um, localities that have been revisited a lot so when i see something that looks close to it um, is it the same thing or not? And, and try to use those. Um, you can also kind of look for duplicates that aren't exact duplicates once you have the data in Arctos. So that's kind of a useful tool. Um, it's a little bit kludgy because you have to sort of like change one field at a time um, where everything else being equal, if this field is different, um, show me all of the duplicate localities um, but it can be useful if you if you have an idea of what you're looking for. Teresa can I also suggest um, two things one is if, if you feel like this is likely to be a locality that is already in there that has been used before you can use the the mapping functions in Mark to Arctos to see what other specimens have been have come from that area and see if you want to use one of those other previous localities. The other thing is in the single record data entry uh, screen you have the option of pulling locality data from another specimen. So if you know that, it, and I do this all the time because I'm dealing with parasites and hosts and I wanna make sure that they share the same locality or collecting event information. Um, and I want, so I want that to be identical. I want to actually share the exact locality. Um, but uh, that's, I don't know, Teresa, if you wanna pull up the single record data entry screen and just show where that pull function is. Oh, sure, yeah, I can do that. Let me, me reshare. I think I'm gonna have to log in too because I'm pretty sure I got logged out. So the idea is that if you know there's another specimen from the same area that's already in there, rather than having to go and search separately on a locality ID and try to figure out which it was, which it is, it's just you can just um, enter the catalog number or some other ID of that specimen right there at relationship, Teresa. If you go up. Oh, sorry and say, so collector number, whatever it is, 1690. Um, if you just say, click on pull, hmm. it will give you the option of, okay, here's other possible specimens with that collector number. Maybe you want to um, save both the event ID or the locality ID or the collectors or all of the above to your new record and have it be exact so that they're sharing the exact same locality. And Can you uh, see the pop-up screen? Yeah. Okay, cool. Sometimes they don't yeah. show. So you would select under the save to data entry box, which of those, if any, you wanted to, to sh share, and then you would choose from the list down there of all of those specimens with that same collector number. And if you click that, it will populate um, the screens below with the information you pulled from that original record. And that's an, the same locality and, and or event ID and or collectors that you've chosen. So you don't have to worry about a student trying to re-enter it and then 
adding an extra space or period and changing the locality ID at that point, you're using the exact same one as previously entered. And a lot of times, even if you are bulk loading, it's handy just to have this single record entry screen open uh, so that you can reference the code tables without going uh, the other route that Teresa already showed, but you can just click, simply click on the drop down menu to see, oh, what are my options for nature of ID? Um, and you can just, or attributes, and then you can just see exactly how it's formatted to make sure you're replicating that in your spreadsheet. Yeah, and especially for some of these attributes and part names, they're specific to collection types. So you get a more compact list here than you do if you look at the big code table, which is associated with all collection types. Um, you can filter those down to look at a single collection type, but sometimes this is just easier to see. It's also helpful to look at the, to put in a tax law name or an agent name here, and it'll tell you whether or not that is already accepted in Arctos. If you hit, if you put in a tax law name and hit tab, for example, or an agent name and hit tab, it will check code tables to make sure um, that exists already. And you don't have to write the whole thing out. You can start typing it and it'll search the available terms. This will bring up every single Joseph and you can go pick the one that you want. Anything else? I guess since we were talking about pull, one last thing is under that relationship tab, Teresa, since you're there, mm -hmm. that drop down, show people what relationships you can create in Arctos between yeah. records. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, and this one can be kind of hard when you're doing data entry in a bulk load um, because you can't create a relationship to a record that doesn't exist. So um, sometimes I find these other IDs that are relationships um, have to get added after the fact. And it's really easy to do. There's a tool for it, um, but it's a super useful thing. And realize that if you do create a relationship, for example, parasite or host of or same lot as or parent of, if you create that relationship and the, and another, the other catalog item exists in Arctos, um, it will create a reciprocal linkage from the catalog record pages of both of those records and allow them to be searchable across their relationships. Yeah, they'll be linked together. Yeah, and just to add on to that, um, the, you know, migrating into Arctos, you are creating kind of your, your basic source records and then there's all these add-ons. So if you want to show the bulk loader, um, just the different template options um, or batch tools. Oh, sorry. you mean all the tools, yeah. Yeah, so um, these are kind of, once your records are in, then you can start doing fun things like adding media or citations. Um, and then you can even add things to records. So maybe you, you have a record and you've ended up um, subsampling a lot of parts. You can do a big bulk load and, and kind of augment your record through bulk loaders rather than having to hand edit that. Um, same with transactions like loans or object tracking. Um, so there's a lot of really cool uh, batch tools to kind yeah, of which, make things more uh, yeah, bulk loading legacy loans is one of the things that's not on the standard data migration, but lots of people want to do it once they get their data in. Um, and it's, it's, there's tools for it. It's pretty easy. You just got to get your data formatted um, in a CSV and you can upload it and um, it, it's a nice, nice thing to have. And one other um, tool that once your records are in, rather than bulk loads, it's, it's called the manage menu, and it's also a way to make global updates. So maybe you want to, um, you know, all of your um, your frogs are getting split and renamed to a different genus. Um, you can actually just uh, pull all those, do a search for those records, and then um, through the manage menu, apply a new ID to all those records. So if you're doing a big taxonomic update, um, if you want to add a bunch of records to a new accession, there's all sorts of options. Um, so, so another way to kind of globally update records. Yeah, it's a very, very useful tool. 
I think that's a good point, um, Emily and, and Teresa, that if, if everything doesn't have to be perfect going into Arctos, if there are a lot of tools once the record is there that you can use for data cleanup and, 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 audit, and editing and appending data to them. Um, it's helpful to have it. It'll save you time down the line if you can get rid of most of the um, errors or it makes, it makes things a lot more discoverable later. But there are tools once things are in Arctos to do that kind of data cleanup as well. Yeah, I think for a lot of people migrating into any software, right, there is this propensity to be like, I want to get this all perfect. I want to cross reference with the ledgers or the specimen tags. And a lot of times it is just easier to get it in um, and do cleaning um, on the Arcto side. You can do a lot of cleaning beforehand, but you can also um, always have the option to do it once it's in. And sometimes it's just easier to visualize uh, that way as well. So true. And then just one thing also to mention for GitHub, um, if you haven't used GitHub, uh, it's, it's, really, it's a really awesome tool. Not only will you be able to easily communicate with your mentor, but um, other Arctos community members are on it. So they'll actually be able to see your questions and maybe get to them you know, immediately before your mentor does. Um, and it's a, it's a great way to, to meet your, your fellow Arctos uh, colleagues and um, you know, just put out, uh, float out questions, whether they're, um, you know, new questions or, or ones we've all asked start before um, to the community and, and get a, a quick response. So um, yeah, it's a great platform. Yeah, I always encourage people uh, once they start uh, working in Arctos to any question you have, ask it here because there's so many more eyeballs looking at here than just my email or Emily's email or whatever. Um, and oftentimes you'll get, sometimes you'll get two or three answers and you can pick and choose which one works best for you. <laughs> so um, it, this is really the best way to communicate with the community is through GitHub. And it's the way a lot of new tools are developed. Um, you're like, hey, we need this really specific thing. And then another collection will be like, actually, we do that too. And so that's, that's kind of where ideas are born and, and, um, and discussed. Definitely. And, and all these issues um, related to data migration, each one has links to things that are in our, um, in our handbook. If I can get to it. Um, I kind of put it on this page because these are sort of the first things that I have people look at um, joining Arctos and getting started in GitHub. Um, but we have a whole list of how to's for all kinds of things. And these are all written by Arctos users. So some of them are great. Some of them are out of date. Some of them are a little bit cryptic. Um, but it's a great place to start um, because often you can find the answer to your question in here or at least get halfway there and maybe ask a more intelligent question later. So I always encourage people to check here first if you are looking for information about how to do something in Arctos. Um, any last questions before we wrap up? And takers? All right. Well, thank you so much, Teresa. That was a great rundown. And um, this has been recorded, so I'll put this up on um, our Arctos YouTube station and get that posted if, if you need to come back or refer, refer people. So yeah, thanks so much for your time. And thanks great. everyone for joining us. Oh, thanks, Teresa. Sure. <laughs> All right. Have a good night. <laughs> See ya. Bye.